Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. Welcome to Africa 54. Here's what's coming up. Basiru Diomaye Faye, Senegal's president-elect, promises to govern with humility and transparency once sworn in. Kenyan authorities have released hundreds of bodies of victims of a doomsday starvation cult almost a year after they were discovered in mass graves. And in our health report, Lino Mudu speaks with an expert on how to maintain oral hygiene. All this and much more coming up on today's Africa 54. Senegal's president-elect Basiru Diomaye Faye, a political newcomer popular among uh, disaffected youth, is promising to govern with humility and transparency. Faye said to be declared the next president after his main rival called him to concede defeat, thanked President Macky Sall and other candidates for respecting Senegal's democratic tradition by recognizing his victory well before official results. Africa 54 managing editor Vincent Macquarie has more. Provisional results showed Faye with about 53.7% and Amadou Ba from the current ruling coalition with 36.2% based on tallies from 90% of polling stations in the first round vote according to the Electoral Commission. Ba and Saal both congratulated Faye, hailing the outcome as a win for Senegal, whose reputation as one of West Africa's most stable democracies took a hit when Saal postponed the vote. Le peuple Senegalais the Senegalese people have chosen to break with the past, to give substance to the immense hopes raised by our vision of society. I hope that our vision of society has given substance to their aspirations. I pledge to govern with humility and transparency, and to fight corruption at all levels. I pledge to devote myself fully to rebuilding our institutions and strengthening the foundations of our way of life together. Investors were worried about whether a new government would be less business friendly than South government, which attracted investors into infrastructure. President elect Faye sought to reassure them. I would like to say to the international community and to our bilateral and multilateral partners that Senegal will always hold its ground and remain a friendly country and a reliable ally to any partner who engages with us in virtuous, respectful, and mutually productive cooperation. It's hoped that the vote will bring stability and an economic boost after three years of unprecedented political turmoil. As for Faye, he owes much of his success to the backing of opposition leader Osman Sonko, who was barred from running due to a defamation conviction. The two had campaigned together under the slogan Diomaye Isonko and have promised to tackle corruption and prioritize national economic interests. They are particularly popular among young voters in a country where more than 60% of people are under 25 and struggle to find jobs. Sonko's and Faye's campaign was also buoyed by police crackdowns and protests, the government's failure to cushion rising living costs, and the authorities' failed attempt to postpone the election by 10 months. Senegal's international bonds rose on reports that Faye was close to being declared the winner, reversing sharp falls from earlier in the day. Sonko and Faye have said they will introduce a new currency and renegotiate mining and energy contracts in a country that is set to start producing oil and gas later this year. Vincent McCory, VOA, Washington. For the latest news developments in Senegal, I'm joined live via Skype from Dakar by VOA correspondent Mariama Diallo. Mariama, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Esther. I'm very excited to be here today. What more can you tell us about the change in power? Well, after months of tension, as you can see from that piece uh, from Vincent, months and months and months, even years of tension, uh, the Senegalese people have spoken. Uh, obviously, the leading uh, candidate, the ruling party coalition leading candidate, Amadou Bay, yesterday called uh, for the press to come in. Uh, you know, we were sitting there, we waited for four hours uh, for finally to hear him uh, concede, uh, hear him tell us that he had congratulated his opponent. He wished him well. He wishes him well. 
and uh, just hopes that, uh, you know, God accompanies uh, him in uh, his mission uh, and his goals uh, for the future of Senegal. Obviously, a few uh, hours later, late in the night, actually, we were at that uh, place uh, where you show uh, Jamai uh, also mm -hmm. uh, basically thanking uh, his supporters, uh, talking about uh, what his uh, goals are and what uh, he hopes uh, to do, uh, basically, uh, for Senegal in the next five years, since it's, uh, you know, it's not official yet, but uh, he's definitely the president-elect at the moment. Mariema Faye is only 44, voted overwhelmingly by the youth of Senegal. What are the expectations of the youth when he takes over the presidency? Well, you're so right. He's only 44 years old, and yesterday was actually his birthday. Uh, was his birthday uh, yesterday? And uh, overwhelmingly, the youth uh, obviously support him. Uh, I've also heard uh, uh, it's not just the youth; it's also uh, some of the people in the other age groups uh, seem to have also supported him because they seem to want a, a complete uh, change at this time around. Uh, but I think the, for the youth, uh, their biggest issue from all the interviews I've done had to do with you know, a high cost of living. It's not just the youth, but for them in particular, it's not only high cost of living, but it's jobs. And it's jobs, jobs, and jobs. 75% uh, of the, uh, in, in Senegal, 75% uh, of the population is, uh, is, uh, is young. So most of them uh, go through universities, you know, uh, get diplomas, but they can't find work. So one of the biggest problems, uh, I think, for the youth uh, had to do with just how to come up uh, with jobs. And that, those are the conversation, conversations I've had uh, with most of the people that I, that I interviewed. Mariama will be watching, looking to see what other developmental changes he's likely to make for Senegal and the region. Mariama Diallo is VOA Nairobi Bureau Chief. Mariama, thank you for joining us there. The future of South Africa's ruling African National Congress, the credibility of South Africa's independent electoral commission, and the peacefulness of the country's May 29th national elections is being tested at the electoral court in Bloemfontein Tuesday as the court delivers judgment in the matter in which the ANC wants the newly formed Mkonto Wesizwe or MK party led by former President Jacob Zuma removed from the ballot paper. Tuso Kumalo has more from Johannesburg. The Electoral Court has ruled that the registration of Umkondo Wesizwe was proper and its name is going to appear on the ballot box. This was after the ANC went to court to try and challenge the registration of the Umkondo Wesizwe, saying it failed to register for this first time and it was only registered uh, for the second time. But the court said the ANC failed to appeal the registration of Umkondo Wesizwe within the 14 days as prescribed by the law. This means now the Umkondo Wesizwe party is going to context the coming elections. Experts are saying this will deal a big blow to the ANC because already the party is luring thousands of voters from the African National Congress. The Umkondo Wesizwe party is now accusing the ANC of trying to get it deregistered because of the threat that it poses to its support base. The ANC itself has not responded to these allegations or to the court ruling today. But come the voting day, experts are saying the ANC will be given a run for its money by this party that's getting a lot of supporters from its support base. Tuso Kumalo for VOA News, your heart. Kenyan authorities on Tuesday began releasing the bodies of victims of a doomsday starvation cult almost one year since the discovery of mass graves in a grisly case that shocked the world. The remains are the first to be handed over to their relatives after months of painstaking work to identify them using DNA. Hundreds of bodies, including those of children, have been exhumed from the shallow mass graves discovered in la last April in a remote wilderness inland from Malindi. Self-proclaimed pastor Paul Ndenge Mackenzie is alleged to have incited his followers to starve to death in order to, quote, meet Jesus in what has been dubbed the Shakahola Forest Massacre. 
Zambian President Hakainde Hichilema recently declared a national emergency because of the drought that has devastated the country's food production and electricity generation. The drought has affected over 1 million hectares of the 2.2 million hectares of land used to cultivate maize, the country's staple crop. U.S. Paul Ndiho spoke with Paul Chisunku, the country director of the African Education Program based in Lusaka, Zambia, to gain more insight into the situation. It is a very difficult period um, in recent history uh, to be faced with um, a national disaster and emergency of this scale uh, that has been brought about by um, the current drought that we're experiencing. Of the 2.2 million hectares uh, that was um, uh, prepared for maize, you're talking of nearly 50% of that crop being affected, totally devastated by the drought, meaning there will be no harvest of that. We have 1 million farming households that have been affected, 6 million individuals that have been affected. We have um, more than 72% of Zambia's districts. We have 116 districts uh, in this country. And of that, 72% have been affected. That means that the extent of this devastation is far reaching. And not only is this affecting the crop, it is also affecting livestock. So livelihoods have been affected at a very wide scale. Zambia, along with other countries uh, in that region, are prone uh, to these uh, uh, severe weather conditions. Uh, some people have attributed these uh, conditions to uh, climate change. Uh, others uh, have different views on that. For people who are in arid areas, who have no access to water, who cannot uh, figure out how to even to manage, how can they deal with this stuff? Very importantly right now, because of the disaster that we are facing, and this is uh, a direction in which the government as well as cooperating partners is already moving, is to increase access to the social cash transfer because resources are needed for these families to be able to meet their basic needs on a daily basis. That is uh, already being undertaken. But beyond that, Paul, it's very important that we enhance our sensitization and awareness around global warming. Because apart from the fact that this is a global phenomenon, there is also an individual contribution, even starting from a farming household level, as individuals such as even myself that may have contributed uh, to the current effects that we're experiencing. This is due to deforestation, uh, for instance. These are issues that we need to continuously raise awareness on. We need to diversify our crops. We need to look at more drought resistant crops so that we can easily enhance our livelihoods and have other sources of income, even for these families, um, farming families that are affected. Apart from that, it's very important for us to have um, serious adapt adaptability uh, to alternative energy because the fact that uh, the shortage of water is going to affect our ability to generate electricity, which is largely hydro generated, means that now more than ever, we need to quickly switch to alternative sources, uh, such as solar, uh, wind power, and any other alternative sources that may be available. That was Paul Chisunku, country director of the African Education Program in Lusaka, Zambia. The U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments on a new abortion case affecting women across the United States on Tuesday. That session is now over. Abortion opponents asked the high court to ratify a ruling from a conservative federal appeals court that would limit access to a medication called mifepristone, which was used in nearly two-thirds of abortions last year. The case comes two years after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, enabling bans or severe restrictions on abortion in many Republican-led states. A decision should come by late June and is likely to become a political campaign issue. Still to come, addressing major oral health issues in Africa. We'll be right back. 
This week on Straight Talk Africa. 2024 has been labelled a super election year. 64 countries worldwide are holding local or presidential elections, including 16 countries in Africa as well as the United States. Some see this as an opportunity for African countries to strengthen democracy. Is the pendulum swinging towards democracy or authoritarianism? Join the discussion with me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. When it comes to the entertainment business, it does not get any bigger than Disney. Leaving an indelible print on networks including BET, ABC, and CNN. Robert has always been about helping people. If somebody tells you that there's no bias in the industry, they'd be lying. Robert takes any and everybody that works for him under their wing. And we had a pretty young uh, staff at BET. They were very talented. I think the average age back then was in and around 25 years old. Giving young people opportunities, um, helping them to discover uh, pathways. Every day I try to take advantage of being here on Earth and, be, and doing something positive because I know I was given another chance. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Linoch Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. In other news, a report released by the International Organization for Migration revealed that at least 63,000 people died or disappeared on migration routes worldwide between 2014 and 2023. Nearly 60 percent of deaths documented were linked to drowning. Togolese lawmakers have adopted a new constitution moving the country from a presidential to a parliamentary system and giving parliament the power to elect the president. The next head of state will be chosen without debate by lawmakers only for a single six-year term. And the trial of the killing of Cameroonian journalist opened on Monday in Yaoundé but was immediately adjourned until April 15th apparently to respond to all the observations and communicate the lists of witnesses. The badly mutilated body of Arseni Solomon Bani Zogo, 50, was found a few days after he was abducted in Yaoundé in January of last year. A group of women from smallhold farms in Zimbabwe are mobilizing their resources to build a shelter for expectant mothers who live far from the nearest clinic. Columbus Mavunga reports from Mashava, Zimbabwe. Women in Mashava are building and funding a shelter for expectant mothers who live far from the nearest clinic. The mothers will be able to stay here while they are waiting to deliver their babies at the Zama Hande clinic about four hour drive south of Harare. Joyce Mapako, who is leading the campaign, says the idea came after many mothers failed to reach the clinic before giving birth. <laughs> Because of the distance to the clinic, most women are giving birth on the way there, or some at home. In some cases, some are lucky to get a car, but it comes speeding, causing accidents. So we resolved that to end that, we need to build the shelter. It helps even after giving birth for a mother to have two, three days at the clinic while being assessed by health officials. Zimbabwe's Minister of Health and Child Care welcomes the development. Nyatwa David is the sister in charge at the Zama Hande Clinic. A mother's shelter is important in the sense that it reduces the number of deaths of children being born at home, being born during the way, on the way to the hospital, and it reduces the transmission of diseases like tetanus because if it's conducted on the way, there will be no one who is able to provide safe delivery services. 
A charity group, Voluntary Service Overseas, is training the smallholder farmers to push for access and quality health services in their community. The women are contributing one dollar and twenty bricks per household. Tekla Ponde heads Voluntary Service Overseas in Eswatini, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Ponde says her organization wants to ensure that women's sexual and reproductive health rights or SRHR are upheld in Zimbabwe. So this shelter was key in that it would facilitate access to SRHR, enable women to access uh, shelter and waiting areas whilst they are on prenatal or even at least when their time is due. So it's very key for us to also look at women's needs and how we support women. Maternal mortality in Zimbabwe is 663 per 100,000 live births, according to results of the 2022 census, slightly higher than the 357 deaths per 100,000 recorded in 2020. The women of Mashawa are hoping their efforts will save lives and lower the number of maternal deaths. Columbus Mavungam, VOA News, Mashawa. Zimbabwe. It's time for a health report and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu. Hello Lino. Hello Esther. Hello everyone. The World Health Organization says over the past 30 years the African region has experienced the most substantial increase in major oral diseases among the WHO's six regions. Despite being largely preventable, oral diseases such as dental caries, gum diseases and tooth loss pose a significant public health challenge in impacting 44% of the region's inhabitants. I spoke with Dr. Yuka Makino, Technical Officer for Oral Health with WHO Regional Office for Africa. 44% of the African regional population is estimated to suffer from oral disease in 2019. What does oral disease include, such as dental caries, tooth decay, periodontal disease, gum disease, and also tooth loss? These oral disease caused by several risk factors such as, I mean, sugar. High sugar is actually caused dental caries. And also tobacco causes a periodontal disease and also oral cancer. And also alcohol also causes oral cancer. And also lack of access to, I mean, fluoride maybe contribute to the um, dental caries as well. Therefore, controlling the risk factor is quite important at the same time these risk factors, mainly sugar, tobacco, and alcohol, also share with other general diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and also cardiovascular disease. People feel that oral disease and then the non-communicable disease are different, but address these common risk factors, we can prevent both diseases. Talk to us about some of the reasons why people are not really concerned about their oral health until maybe it becomes uh, very critical. One of the reasons potentially would be maybe people think the oral disease is very important, but actually not cause death. Some oral disease also cause death, such as if you can, I mean, just remain the untreated dental caries that also potentially cause this. And also, especially in the Western Africa, we have a disease called Noma, that is, I mean, disease of the mouth and face, and then the, especially the children between two to six years old suffering malnutrition and lack of access to the vaccination, poverty situation, because if untreated, the potentially Noma cause around 90% of deaths of that untreated Noma children. Therefore, we should not neglect oral disease. One of the things that uh, we see a lot, and it's very common among people, is bleeding while brushing and also swollen gums. When should we be concerned about these signs and how can we prevent them? This is linked with gingivitis and periodontal disease. Some inflammation happen with your gum. Therefore, if you see gum is not color pink and you feel that there is a dark color of red, or if you also can see some of the plaque or tactus in your teeth, I mean, definitely that potentially causes a periodontal disease. Therefore, you need to brush teeth properly. When you look at the big picture, what can be done to improve oral health care 
in Africa. Definitely, we do not have an adequate number of oral health workforce. According to the Global Oral Health Report, in our continent, for example, the 10,000 population, we only have 0.33 dentists. This is actually the one-tenth of the global ratio. But we still have a half of the population suffering from untreated oral disease. Therefore, we also need to access oral health service. Especially, we need to think about really innovative workforce model to address unmet needs for oral health. For example, especially in African region, people normally cannot access oral health service from oral health promotion, oral disease prevention and treatment at the primary care level, but maybe it is also important to train the non-oral health professional, such as doctor, nurse, and then the uh, midwife, and also community health worker. This person is actually responsible for that primary care level, and if they can provide some of the oral health service, more people can access to oral health service. In our continent, actually, 50% of the country do not have an oral health policy. These policy actually provide the guidance for how to promote oral health and how to prevent and also like a treat oral diseases. WHO have a global and regional guidance for oral health. Therefore, they need to adapt and implement these strategy considering the country context. And then another point is, of course, we also need to think about how we can promote oral health and then prevent oral disease. We tend to think oral disease is individual matter, but actually not only individual matter, because the government also take the more upper level or population level approach, such as in case if you can promote, I mean, fluoride toothpaste at the school setting, or you can also maybe limit the sugar consumption by, I mean, tax on the sugar sweetened beverage. Therefore, government also takes that kind of, I mean, physical policy or any other policy in order to develop the enabling environment to address risk factor for oral disease. And to keep your teeth healthy, the US CDC recommends, among other things, to brush your teeth thoroughly twice a day and floss daily between the teeth to remove dental plaque. If you have diabetes, work to maintain control of the disease. This will decrease the risk of complications, including gum disease. That's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on X at Lenore Moudou. Back to you, Esther. Thanks, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Mudu's health report every Tuesday on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.